Hey guys, in today's video, I want to talk about rent to rent contracts. Exactly what type of contract do you need? How to implement it? What needs to be in there? What to look out for if you're relying on the agent or the landlord? Basically, how does it all work? Because if you're if you're watching this, then you're potentially new. You're just looking at getting started in rent to rent. You're trying to work out like where can I find a contract? All these types of things. I mean, it's all up in the air for you. I get it. You know, I've been in your situation. I've followed all of the other trainers, all of the popular people on YouTube. You know. This is, yeah, I get it. I, I know what you're looking for. So trust me, when I say follow and subscribe to this channel, you're gonna get a lot of value from this channel. I don't glaze over any information. I tell you exactly what you need to hear because I've been in your position and I know what I wanted to hear. That's what I'm gonna tell you. So stay tuned. We're gonna dive deep into rent to rent contracts. Stick around to the end of the video because I'm gonna give you instructions on exactly what to do next. So wait to the very end of this video. I'm gonna give you guys something for free. Okay, so there's three ways you can go about doing this, all right? The first way is you can get a contract drawn up for you. You can go to a solicitor. This is going to cost north of 2,000 pounds for a, a solicitor to draft your business a rent to rent contract suitable to your business model that you can use with estate agents and landlords going forward. 2,000 pounds north. Like we've had the quotes, that is what it costs, okay? Trust me, it's not cheap. So the second way is position yourself as a an estate agent. You're gonna get phone calls from rent to renters and company lets day in, day out. That's that's just how it works. Position yourself as an estate agent. You're gonna you get multiple calls, you're working with multiple company lets, rent to renters. Why have different contracts for each one? Like you're not going to rely on a company let providing you this contract. And as an estate agent or a lettings manager within the estate agent, you're not going to read through this contract. You want to understand your own contract and own it. And then any company let that you work with, you're going to say, this is our contract between you and the landlord. This is our company let contract. So that's the second one. Don't bother having a contract yourself. Don't go out and buy one. Don't find one and think or don't download one from someone else's training program and hope that is the right one. You work with the state agents, they're going to have their own contract if they do rent to rent. So no need to have one yourself. Simple as that. If estate agents do rent to rent, they work with company lets, they are going to have a company let contract. They're not gonna waste time working with other company lets and going through their contract, going through their contract. Is this something we work with? Is that something we work with? They're going to have a baseline for their business and introduce you to that contract. So that's that's a simple way out, really, of not buying or owning a contract. If you're working with estate agents, they're going to have a contract if they do company let, all right? In a nutshell, that's it. No need to dive any deeper on that. The third way is join a mentorship program like mine, Rise Up Rent to Rent. We provide you with absolutely everything you need. I'm not gonna go into a sales pitch or tell you loads of details, but if you're joining a mentorship, then you're going to be given everything absolutely everything to run your rent to rent business with all guidance, instructions, reassurance, you know, that's what a mentorship should be, like the whole package. So that's the three ways around getting a contract. So what does a contract look like? Okay, from a baseline of someone who has zero understanding of contracts, I'm going to just ex briefly explain the difference. So as a normal tenant going to a landlord, you would have a, an assured short hold tenancy agreement, an AST agreement between you and the landlord. So you qualify for tenant rights because you're a tenant. That is not what our business wants. We do not want that contract. What you're going to use is a company let agreement. So a business let agreement. Your business is letting this property from the landlord. So we don't qualify for tenant rights. Instantly, that is a benefit to the landlord. I always say there's three types of landlords that would work with a company let. And one of those types is if they've had bad tenant experience. You know, if they've just taken a tenant to court and there's eight months rent arrears, your business model is going to look very appealing. So yes, a company let agreement. So it's not personally attached to you. This is your limited rent to rent company renting a property from a landlord. So your business name will be on the contract. It will have standard details on the contract, such as the rent that you've agreed, the duration, and obviously we should be aiming to rent it long term. So we'd be offering to rent this as three years. But don't worry, like don't worry. Straight away you're thinking, you know, what if it doesn't work? I'm locked in for three years, don't worry. I will explain exactly what you need in these contracts to protect yourself if you ever needed to get out. So we've got the rent, we've got the term. Sometimes as a new business, it depends if you're going through an estate agent or direct to landlord. If you're a homeowner, then you're good for both. If you're not a homeowner, 
then sometimes you can be asked to be personal guarantor for your business. And what that means is if your business can't afford to pay the rent, then the owner of the property can come after you because you're a personal guarantor. So I would say if you're not a homeowner, focus more on landlords. They're, they're more sold on person to person. Every single landlord I've worked with on a serviced accommodation basis and a HMO basis, they are sold on me as a person and my business and the reputation of my business. So I've actually never provided any financial information, bank statements. It's crazy, really. That's me being honest. Landlords are more sold on, do they want to work with you? And their experience and your business model sounds amazing. Then it's all about negotiating it over the line. Estate agents are very rigid. If their process is their process, they do not budge. If they their process includes personal guarantor because your business is younger than two years, then you're quite likely going to need to stand personal guarantor. Then we move on to deposits. You know, this is all negotiable as well, but it depends again on estate agents, how many deals you're taking from them. If you're taking multiple deals, you have more leverage to say, look, I can't afford to take on all of the deposits for the three properties I'm taking from you. How about I get deposit replacement insurance? That's a whole nother piece of content that I'd need to go down. So yeah, the deposits are negotiable because of the benefits you're providing. Guaranteed rent, long-term, cleaners. It's going to be kept immaculate condition. You pay rent on time every time. You're going to manage minor maintenance. Then within the contract, there's a forfeit of the right to occupy. And what this means, this is the benefit of the landlord. Because you're not a tenant, this isn't an AST. If you fail to pay the rent, like within 14 to 28 days, the landlord will have the right. And it would be stated on this contract, you don't pay rent they will just take the property back without court process because don't forget, you don't qualify for tenant rights. You don't pay, they take it away. Then we've got repairs and this can be quite gray. I know there's a lot of different mentorship and training providers that will teach you to take on the repairs and that's how you negotiate the deal because you're gonna take on management and maintenance of this property, which is just crazy. Do not do that. So repairs, I simply state that if you're going to take on a property, take on minor maintenance, only up to the cost of a hundred pound per month and it's not rolling so if that 100 pound isn't spent in january it doesn't become 200 in february 300 in march it resets so your max bill per month for you know maintenance is a hundred pound anything over that that's on the landlord in terms of repairs if you damage it then that's on you you know if if your guests boot in the the oven front door and it smashes the glass then you need to take ownership if the oven door is very rusty and it falls off that's on the landlord you know it's quite like a tenant already so it's tenant duties if you damage it you cover it if it falls apart then the landlord covers it when taking on a property as well the landlord needs to provide you with an inventory like a baseline condition of the property so when you hand it back they've got this report they'll inspect the property this happens with estate agents as well they should do a professional clean and get an inventory prior to giving you the keys. So they have a baseline to reflect on when you hand that property back, what condition it should be in. And obviously with your business model, it should be in the same condition, if not better. Every single property I've done and property I've handed back that has come to the end of the tenancy, I've handed it back in better condition. Like always leave the landlord happy. So you're going to take on bills, council tax, TV license, you know, all of this type of thing, that, that should be included in the contract also. Okay, then we've got landlord's responsibilities and promises. In this section, you really need to have it clear as day that the landlord will take ownership and maintain and manage the gas, the electric, the heating, the water, the drainage, the roof, everything substantial. So you're literally left with tenant duties such as light bulbs, smoke alarm battery. You do not want to be taking on major stuff such as if the boiler breaks down there's 75 pound at least call out charge straight away and if like the heating element needs or the heat exchanger needs replacing there can be hundreds of pounds repair bill which will eat into your profits if not consume all of that month's profit so you can't afford to be doing that this is the landlord's property you are a corporate tenant so in the back of your mind if you're renting a property under your business in the back of your mind you are a corporate tenant you are a tenant as if if I had a three bed flat and I rented it to you and you moved in, boiler broke down, are you gonna go out and fix it by yourself if you're renting a property from me? You're not, are you? You're gonna call me up. Hey, Kenny, the boiler's broke, mate. Okay, 
It's exactly the same with you renting a property under your business. It's exactly the same responsibility. When it breaks, you report it to the estate agent or landlord. Simple as that. Also with EPC, you know, gas, electric certificates, that's the landlord's property, the landlord's equipment. It is up to them to get the property compliant not up to you to make sure that is in the contract as well. Sometimes uh, upon handing the property back in the contract, they will expect you to have some ludicrous requirement. You know, I've seen in someone's, one of my mentees clients that they, they had to paint the exterior of the property with brand new fresh paint with the same color. How stupid is that? So you need to read all of the, like the nitty gritty and just make sure you're not overstretching your commitments. Even at the end of the tenancy, handing it back, you know, you got to look and read those sentences. What does the landlord or this contract ask you to do when handing the property back? Make sure there's nothing silly in there. The types of things that should be in that section upon departing the property is the likes of collecting meter readings and submitting the latest readings to the energy provider. So that's on literally walk as you're walking out the door, you take the meter readings, you close the door, you lock it, you're out. That's it. You've got the latest meter readings. Also things like handing back all keys that was part of the inventory invoices and receipts for any professional cleaning company that has gone in to professionally clean. You know, if it's part of the contract that upon handing the property back, it needs to be professionally cleaned, then you have to provide the receipt for that. And if you don't provide the receipt for that, they send in another professional cleaner, even if you had it done, but you forgot to get the receipt, they'll send in a professional cleaner and they'll invoice you for that charge, which can be up to 750 pounds, depending on how big your property is. Now, the most important part of the contract is break clauses, protecting your business. So, you know, worst case scenario, you need to pull out, can you? And you need to be able to invoke it with legislation changes if you know boom the market has suddenly just changed and you cannot operate anymore you need to be able to get out so this is termination and break clauses for the landlord and yourself and it needs to be clearly stated on here what we teach our mentees is have a 12 month break clause in there for you and the landlord okay so with two months notice as well. So on the 10th month, if you wanted to pull out on the 12th month, you've had to give those two months notice to say to the agent and landlord, we're pulling out on month 12. That's worst case scenario if it's not working. Also, you need a two month legislation break clause in that contract. So let's just say, boom, the whole market suddenly becomes extremely too regulated that rent to renters are dead, which will never happen by the way. I get this comment time and time again, like rent to rent is gonna die because the Labour government are going to do this and do that. I'm like, it's not, it's nothing to do with rent to rent. Rent to rent is just a strategy name. Like these guys are so clueless. It's a company let agreement, right? This, if they ever bring company let agreements to an end, then many, many businesses will not be able to lease properties to run as businesses. Even the local kebab shop, like literally, the local kebab shop will be on a company let agreement. They won't be buying that unit. I don't know, some might, but quite often they will lease it. Their business will lease it from a landlord or another business owner, so it will be a company let agreement. Yeah, time and time again, I get that objection on Instagram. Like, you guys don't know what you're doing, what you're doing is illegal. I'm like, no, you haven't got a clue what we're doing you assume we're on an AST agreement. This is a company let agreement. It's perfectly legal. It's in many different business niches, down to hairdressers. Premier Inn will be doing company let agreements because they don't buy their buildings. They lease them on extremely long term. So it'd be a company let agreement. So company let agreements are everywhere from rent to rent to many, many other businesses. But my point being, if the legislation changes around rent to rent, and you can no longer operate because for some reason you now need this in that property and this and it just doesn't become viable and the profit margins are all swallowed up. You need to invoke a two month break clause because the legislation changes. So if you can prove there's a legislation change which has now affected your profit margins in your business, you can give that to the agent and landlord and invoke the two month break clause. So make sure you get that in your contract as well. Another thing to look out for is agents quite often include a statement where you're not allowed to sublet the rooms, which is, Silly because this is a company let agreement. So make sure that isn't, they haven't put that in there. Like you are allowed to sublet the rooms. That needs to be in there. If that's for the HMO model, right? It needs to be quite clear that within that contract, the intention of the use of the property is in the contract. What you are intending to use the property for, make sure that is 
in there somewhere. It doesn't matter where, just the property use. And it's got to be clear on your intentions for the property. So if the landlord ever gives you stick for you're using this property for this, it's like, well, yeah, here's the contract. Clear intention of use. You sign this contract. So it's all about covering your ass. Like I'm sure you guys know in many different areas of your life, you you covered your ass for something. This is what this contract is for. It's for protecting your business. And if you ever needed to get out, you're covered. If you ever needed to cover yourself because the landlord got confused because of some unknown reason, you're covered. Everyone is responsible for their own actions. If you sign a contract that you didn't really read and then understand that this business is now using the property for that use, like Airbnb, then you kick up a stink. And then the business owner turns around to you and be like, well, it's in this contract. It clearly states here, you're going to look like an absolute tool. Not you, the landlord, just saying like, it's all about covering your ass. So I hope this video has been helpful. There's not much else, like everything else is just standard text. But that that is the bulk of what is in a company let agreement. It's very similar on the service accommodation side. You know, it's a company let agreement. Don't get a management contract because then you have to get client money protection. If you're managing the property on behalf of the landlord, that's a whole different ball game. What we want to be doing is renting the property on a company let agreement and then the rent becomes an expense. So you don't need client money protection because you're not operating that property on behalf of the landlord or the property owner. You're not a management company. You are a guaranteed rent company. But yeah, it can be quite confusing on stuff you find online and types of contracts. But essentially, everything I've mentioned in this video is what you need to look out for. It needs to be a company let agreement. Do not sign an AST ever for a property you're taking on under a rent to rent business. No matter what the landlord, what the estate agent, what the deal sourcer says, like we've we've used it, I've heard it all before, we've used this type of contract with many company lets, like I've literally, I can list the clients that I've had that objection with, with the estate agent, and I don't care what the estate agents say, we're the professional, we educate them, like I know it sounds arrogant, but there's quite a lot of estate agents that operate rent to rent businesses under them on AST agreements, and it's just, is ludicrous. So always, 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 you know, it needs to be a company let agreement. All right, guys, cool. I hope that was very helpful. Let me know in the comments if it was. Appreciate you guys being here. Click the link in the description. It is the three hacks on how to stand out from a crowded market. So make sure you're clicking that. It's something I've created. It teaches you all of the tactics that I teach my clients. Brilliant. It's literally what works. We get deals from it. It's how to stand out from the crowded market and implement those tactics correctly to get those deals. Okay, guys, appreciate you. See you on the next one.